Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning. <laughs> I thank you, God. I thank you that you have given me a prophetic word. Yeah. That, um, that will put in the hearts of every man, woman, and child the word, there is still time. Father, and I thank you that as you, with your outstretched arm, reach out for us and say, there is still time, but there will probably come a moment <clears throat> that we'll run out of time. And so, Father, I pray that to every ear, every heart of every single person under the sound of my voice would hear you speak today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, <clears throat> amen, amen. Come on. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Good morning. I'm excited. I'm so glad you joined us. Here we are back again as you guys are sitting in your homes. And uh, I'm preaching to not an empty sanctuary, but just, you know, a few of our worship team uh, and a few of our media team out here. But you know what? You're super missed. Um, this will only be for a few weeks, um, and I'm excited about it. You know, the, the, the message today is kind of funny because, you know, we were going to have John Ramirez that had to get pushed back. All kinds of stuff started happening. Uh, we had a sermon series uh, we're going to start next week that um, is called Joy No Matter What. And so I was sitting down uh, praying. I was sitting down praying, and I read in my Bible, I had... This is a little thing that Tony Evans kind of puts there, and it said, there is still time. And the Lord began to speak to me about a message that I think a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, I don't remember now what time, but um, it was brewing in me, and God began to speak to me and download something. And, you know, we, we, get, we believe that some messages are right here for the house, right? But there are some messages that God gives you. Um, that he's like, look, this message is for the planet. It's for the world. It's for everybody. Not just get rap church, but the church in general. And when he talks to me like that, I get a little bit nervous because, you know, I mean, you know, I want to deliver what he's saying uh, accurately. And so um, we are calling it church clothes or at the table. Church clothes or at the table, right? In other words, um, is our relationship with Christ based upon more looking like we have a relationship? Or are you sitting at the table, communing with Him, uh, common union with Him, getting to know Him, living by way of what He's sharing with you, and living by way of His ways? In other words, not just an exterior relationship, but an inner man relationship. Um, or, you know, for a person like me, I love fashion. But just because you look fly on the outside doesn't mean that your relationship, you could buy the t-shirt, you could go to the concerts, you could know all the songs, you could be a rapper, you could be a worshiper, you could be a great preacher. And the reality is that there were a lot of peoples in the Bible, and there's a common theme in the Bible that show a lot of the Pharisees and people who knew the word but did not know God, who knew about him but yet did not live it, who would point out people's flaws and tell people what to do, but they were not willing to live it themselves. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Jude. Beautiful chapter. You know, one chapter, 25 verses. And the cool part about it is that when you finish this, you feel like, yes, I finished the whole book of the Bible. Short book of the Bible. But super important book of the Bible. Now, you know, we've been talking about the book of James. Uh, we, we had a whole sermon series on the book of James. We established that we are heavens, and uh, meaning that we were citizens of heaven. It talked about people... Uh, who were just hearers and not doers of the word. It talked about uh, listening and being slow to speak and not getting angry. It talked about all kinds of beautiful things. And in the book of Jude, it's important to know that Jude was also half-brother of Jesus. So here we got James, the in-your-face apostle, and I feel like Jude was kind of like right uh, beside him also talking about these things. And so we see in this chapter um, a lot of great things. You see them talking about contending for the faith, in other words, fighting uh, for what they believe in, recognizing the threats to the faith. 
and building a strong faith. We see all these three uh, subject matters and from verses 1 all the way through 25 because you have to understand I'm going to read you a little bit of this and I, I want to ask you a question after it right these people if you look at Jude chapter uh, well let's start in the beginning it says Jude a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James uh, which is pretty cool because he could have used the whole so people can honor him more he could have been like yo half brother of James or half brother of Jesus and he didn't he, he said a servant of Jesus Christ and then he says to those who are called loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. I love this part. It says, dear friends, because here's what he was really going to write about. I need you to see this. He was going to talk about salvation. Um, so he says, dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share. In other words, all these people who were brothers and sisters had died at the cross. They all identified with Jesus Christ. So he's saying he was going to talk about the salvation that they share, right? And then it says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. Well, now he has to shift it out a little bit because we were going to talk about, we were going to talk about Jesus. We're going to probably break some bread. But now he's like, look, that's what we were going to talk about. But now I got to change it up because there's a problem. So I want you to contend for the faith. That was delivered to the saints once and for all. For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. In other words, these people creeped in, right? These people creeped in. The Bible says that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. When you look at that scripture, you always got to understand it's kind of like under the radar. Uh, it means stealth. And here they're using that word again. It comes under the radar. It says they, by stealth, they are ungodly turning the grace of our God into sensuality or pleasure, right? And denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. In other words, they were holding people to the law while participating in libertarian types of lifestyle, using grace as a license to sin. These people were just super free. You could do whatever you want to do. And that's how they were living. And they were denying their Lord Jesus Christ. And he was going to talk about, yo, well, let's kick it. Let's break bread. All of a sudden, he's like, look, let's just talk about somebody has creeped in and they're trying to change these things. And remember that I said in the beginning of this message that I felt like God was telling me that this was a message for the people today. Meaning that I believe that the next thing that's going to happen is people are going to start walking away from the faith. And there's going to be, I know that we're talking about this remnant. And I know that we're talking about all these people. But remember that at the end times, it also talks about a narrow road. It also talks about a narrow road. And that the other road is wider. So there's going to be a whole lot more people in, the, in this wide road than there is in the narrow road. And even though I believe there's going to be a, a, what I call, you know, what we call the remnant, I feel it's just the people who really follow. Right, The people who truly believe and the brothers and sisters who understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by way of them living it in their life. So I have a question for you this morning. Are you lost? You know, I was thinking about that and I was like, lost. I was like, well, in order for me, because I was in the car driving and I was like, in order for me to know that I'm lost, I have to have known where I'm going. And if I know where I'm going... Then I could only properly assess, man, I'm lost because I knew where I was going. Now, the amazing part is I started also thinking about being found, right? Because if I'm found, is it possible to be lost? If you're found, is it possible to be lost? I don't know. I'm asking you some questions to get you thinking before we jump into really what I want to talk about. So you could be, is it possible to really be lost but you think that you're saved or you think that you're found because you appear to be that way. It appears that you got into the right place, but you wind up figuring out that you're lost. And is it possible to be lost and really be able to be found? And I know right now you're like, what is he talking about? Okay, we're going to jump into this text. Are you ready? So it's Jude chapter 1, uh, verse 11 through 16. And, um, you know, because I believe that you could be in a garbage can long enough and smell like garbage and you won't really smell the trash because you've been in there for so long that you really don't know that you are lost, yet you think you're found. You following me? Okay, so Jude 1, 11, 16. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation, and I'm probably going to read 17 right here from the verse right here in the uh, CSB translation. Uh, so here we go. Okay, it says, How terrible... It is for them 
For they have followed in the steps of Cain. They have abandoned themselves to Balaam's error because of their greedy pursuit of financial gain. And since they have rebelled like Korah rebelled, they will experience the same fate of Korah and likewise perish. I'll explain that to you here in a minute. He got swallowed up. But here it is. These false teachers are like dangerous hidden reefs at your love feast. Now, you know, get right, we're all about love. Love is here, love fast. So, you know, I love how they use the term love feast, right? So these people have creeped in and they are now sitting at the table, kind of like a Judas. They're sitting at the table um, at your love feast, lying in wait to shipwreck the immature. Now, I think that's powerful, right? Because they're going after the ones who really don't spend time with Jesus, but are saved. They're going after the immature to try to twist them and bend them in the way that they want them to go. That is trying to pull them away of what Jesus really wants to do in their life. And then it says, they feast among you without reverence. They, they eat among you without respect. Having no shepherd but themselves. In other words, these people are their own lords. These people are their own saviors. They don't spend time listening to the direction that God wants to take them in. they still all about themselves, having a form of godliness, but no power thereof. They are clouds with no rain, swept along by the winds like fruitless late autumn trees, twice dead, barren, and plucked up by the roots. Come on. They are wild waves of the sea, flinging out the foam of their shame and disgrace. They are misleading like wandering stars, for whom the complete darkness of eternal gloom has been reserved. Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, prophesied of their doom when he said, Look, here comes the Lord Yahweh with his countless marauds of holy ones. Come on, they were rolling deep. He comes to execute judgment against them all and to convict each one of them for their ungodly deeds and for all the terrible words that uh, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are always complaining. These are some of the clues right here of what some of those people look like. They're always complaining and never satisfied, finding fault with everyone. They follow their own evil desires and their mouths speak scandalous things. They enjoy using seductive flattery to manipulate others. Now here's, here it is, 17. Look at 17. This is in another translation, but here we go. But you, but you, dear friends, but you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time. There will be scoffers living according to their own godly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly not having the spirit. I'm going to read that last part again. This is, I went from 17 to 19. These people create divisions and are worldly not having the spirit. Come on, I believe that even when we talk about what's happening today and everybody's out there really, I believe that the, the liar, the liar, which is Satan, he's been on the earth for so long, way longer than any of us. He is the father of lies. He is the master of deception. And he will throw out lies out there and get people to bite him all the time. And everybody's fighting and the blacks and the whites and the Hispanics. And even though nobody really wants to really come out and talk about how they feel and they're sharing things and they're shaking their fists. And I, I hear all that. But when I watch from afar, I start thinking of scripture. Scriptures like like uh, we our fight is not against flesh and blood and I start thinking about history on the how the Hispanics fought the Hispanics and how the black folks fought the black folks and how the white folks fought the white folks I mean we could go to England we could go to Africa all of these things back back in the day same people were fighting the same people so yet the spirit of division was there and when you look at today it would only be one person that would try to stop and divide us while we're here catching the fight and really going through all this thing we're not really realizing that our fight is not against flesh and blood and we're devouring one another and we're talking things based upon feelings and emotions and it says right here man that these people would create divisions in a worldly not having the spirit of god and i've been thinking about that stuff and i was thinking about Cain and Balaam and Korah and these guys were pretty religious guys on the outside. Come on. They had a form of godliness yet no power thereof. And you're going to hear me say that over and over in this sermon. Come on. They had church clothes but they weren't sitting at the table. 
Come on. They had a form of godliness, yet they had no power. They did not sit at the table. They did not enjoy the love feast. They were at the love feast pointing everything that was wrong to try to bring division. Come on. I, I only have authority to speak to the church, the church folks. I, I'm saying we got to get this better inside the church house. Because how could a world see a people who represent heaven well if we don't do it ourselves well? Come on. Uh, uh, we, see God, the, we see Cain was a religious worshiper of God. So he only worshiped God on his terms and not God's. Come on. The next guy was Balaam. He was a religious prophet for hire. He loved money. He always went to the highest bidder and was willing to switch sides only for gain. And then we had Korah, a religious leader but was a rebel against God's chosen leader and thus God's will. What did they all have in common? Jude repeats it four times at the end. They were all ungodly. They were boldly defiant towards the things of God, right? They had a form of godliness, yet no power thereof. Come on, they had a lack of respect for what was of God and sacred. Come on, Jews throws the word sinners. It means a person devoted to sin. Come on, you're all in. You follow anything that would cause you to sin. Someone whose very nature opposes God and his will. I want to take you to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy. I need you to understand something. When you think about Korah, he led 250 men in rebellion against the leadership of Moses. Come on, there's a lot of people out there that are always talking about the leadership that God puts in place. Think about it. Everybody's fighting. There's all kinds of division, whether you're Democratic, Republican, all of this stuff. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's fighting. And the reality is there's only one person winning there. The earth opened up and swallowed Korah alive. Things of the earth enticed the false teachers and they would be swallowed up by their greed and everything that the world had to offer. I wanted to take you to um, 2 Timothy 3. I'm just going to read this. It's okay if I read scripture, right? We're in church. It says, but know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. Come on, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good. Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power, avoid these people. I'm going to read a little bit more. For among them are those who worm their way into household and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions. Come on, watch out, ladies. Always learning. And never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Man, that rocked me right there. Always learning, but never coming to a full knowledge of the truth. Because they did not experience the cross of Christ. They did not deny themselves and follow Jesus. Come on, you're only a disciple when you're following Christ. And here you have people who were puffed up in their knowledge. Oh, it's so good. It says, just as uh, Janners and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. There are men who are corrupt in mind and worthless in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be clear to all. In other words, we're going to see who these people are. As was the foolishness of Jans and Jambres. Man. You go on in the scriptures, and it talks about you continuing in what you have learned and firmly believed. Brothers and sisters, I think we're coming to one of these times where we're really going to see if it was just about church clothes or were you sitting at the table. I was talking to my son today earlier. I was talking to somebody. I think it was my son. and um, I was sharing that. I said, man, you know what is crazy? Like during coronavirus, everybody started sitting at the table and having relationships again. And everybody really started talking again. And everybody started caring about what the other person was thinking. And even during these times where all the injustice is happening, people finally are coming to a table to really hear each other's sides. And all of these things are happening. And I started thinking, man, God, it would be like if I'm always hanging out with love, I'm going to become like love. And the things that are important to God 
are going to be important to me. And what God loves, I'm going to love. And I was thinking about the things that are important to God and how those things should be important. But if you're not spending time and you're just reading the verses to point out what everybody else is doing wrong, then you're not going to have fruit. You're not going to have fruit. A form of godliness denying the power. When you look at that, you look at, I, I, I don't know about y'all, but I, I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. And so I think most Hispanic homes, or maybe, I don't know if you had it, but we had plastic fruit. In other words, plastic fruit, if you eat that, there's no nutritional value. There's nothing good that comes out of plastic fruit. And when you are just about church clothes, but not really sitting at the table, you're plastic fruit. In other words, there's nothing nutritional. Nobody can actually eat from the fruit that you have, whether it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things, see, I believe that a fruit is there on a tree so that it could mature into a proper maturity so that others can eat from your fruit and then that they can also grow. It's a seed that goes from person to person. Everything that the Lord made, made it with seed in it so that it can go from that to creating another and creating another and creating another. Therefore, we can be fruitful and we can multiply and it starts in our homes. And I was thinking about the three guys, man, the false prophet, the false worshiper, Come on, the false leader. Come on, one that would worship on his terms. In other words, he bowed down when it was convenient for him. You do the things that God is calling you to do when you want to do them. But not really when he wants you to do them. And I was thinking about this because if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And, and there's a comma there, and we've talked about this before, where we truly start to think that, Man, I, I don't have to. I get to. I get to follow Christ. I get to be a husband. I, I, I get to do these things. And I was thinking that when I was reading Jude, and the Lord took me to uh, 2 Timothy 3, and then he also reminded me about the prodigal son. Now, I'm going to read you a few quick verses, which is Luke 15. I'm going to read 7, and this is where he's talking uh, to uh, he's talking to the sinners and the Pharisees are actually talking to him about what on earth are you doing? How can you possibly be sitting with those people? You cannot obviously be talking to them about the kingdom. What do they want to know about the kingdom? It's basically what's happening, right? Um, and so he goes to the, so he starts telling them a par uh, parable. And in this parable, he's talking about the hundred sheep and one left. So he ends it, you know, in seven, it says, I have found my lost sheep. It says, rejoice with me. Now, remember, he's talking to the Pharisees because the Pharisees were confused to why he was sitting with the sinners. And he says, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. And then he goes to the next one, right? Because remember, he's talking to the Pharisees. Because I know when we preach the prodigal son, we're always talking about the guy who was with the prostitutes that spend all the money, the, the, the sinner of sinners, right? And so here he talks about uh, the lost sheep, and then he goes into the lost coin. And let me tell you what he says. Uh, it says in 9, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, rejoice with me. Because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So the common theme here is he goes after that one, the lost sinner who repents for the lost sheep. The 99, they good. The one who's a sinner that belongs to the Lord when we go and we talk to them y'all following the drip y'all following me good 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 so here we go and then he starts to talk and he hits him with the prodigal son now remember he's still talking to the Pharisees he's still talking to a form of godliness yet no power thereof he's talking to people who point everything out He's talking to people who weren't willing to live it themselves. Come on. They were legalistic. Come on. They, 
with the long beard and they would talk to people and they would tell them yo you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong but they really weren't living it for themselves and the whole objective here is Jesus has given them a parable to show them what God looks like and now he goes into the prodigal son and he begins to talk to them about two sons one who asked for his inheritance and he said pops Give me all I got. Give me what's mine. It belongs to me. And he goes out into this place and he goes, he gets high. No, that's my story. Uh, okay. He goes out there. He hangs out with the prostitutes. He probably drinks it up. He goes to the strip club. He goes everywhere. He didn't bump into heels to halos that night. He just went into the strip club and he lost it all. Maybe that's how you feel today. Maybe you're like, man, that's me. I'm lost. I was born, and I could have had everything that the Father, and he said, here. And you took it, and you spent it all, and you messed it up. And so one day, that lost child, man, he's hanging out. He's like, man, he winds up, work with somebody. They're going to feed him with the pigs. Now, think about it. He was Jewish, so it was the thing he would never do. You ever been in a situation where... Maybe right now you're at a place where you are like, you know, they say, don't ever say never because you wind up there. And maybe you got to the end of your rope or to a place where you're like, man, this is the last straw. And that's where he was at. It says he came to his senses and he was finally like, Wow, the servants in my father's house are living way better than this. So he runs back to the father. The father with open arms, you know, he throws the party. Big old party. Love feast, man. Puts the ring on it. Does all these things and blesses him. And then there was a second brother who, you, who was living in the house. He was hanging out. He worshiped. He prayed. He did all of these things. You hear? He was probably worshiping in the morning. Long rep- 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 prayers that were repetitive. Doing all of these things standing probably look at me because even he says man I was out there working and he, he even throws that back at the father remember and all of a sudden I love the fact when it says in uh, chapter 15 verse 31 son he said to him you are always with me and everything I have is yours but we had to celebrate and rejoice because the brother of yours was dead and now he's alive again he was lost and now he's found. If you look back at the verses right before, and it says he became angry and he did not want to go in. Man, I'd spin in my, I'm like, he didn't want to go in. And I started thinking he got mad when he gave everything to the other one. And he was the first brother. So he, was, he, was he really just with that father for what the inheritance that he could get? Was that the reason why he was out there doing works, doing all these things? But yet, when the father asked him to come in to get excited about the lost brother who once was dead but now is alive, the brother who had been in the house gets angry. And I started to really look at the scripture when it said he was angry and he did not go in. So here you have a guy with the prostitutes spending everything that he got, and yet still he runs into the father's arms, and he goes back into the house. But the one who was in the house, maybe he was the one who was lost. Maybe he was the one who was blind. Maybe he's the one who will not even enter. Because if he's talking to the Pharisees, and the second brother looks like the Pharisees, he's saying, man... God goes, after the, God goes after the lost sheep. God goes after the lost coin. And how could you possibly have a relationship with God if you're not into what God is into? How could you possibly not be excited that I'm sitting with the sinners talking to them about the kingdom of God? How could you possibly not get excited about what gets God excited? And so I decided to ask you a few questions today that actually come out of the book of James. James said that a true test of a person's faith is do we love our neighbor enough to care for the widows and often? Do we love our neighbors enough not to show favoritism to the rich? Do we love our neighbor enough not to send away a poor brother or sister with just a word of blessing but no food? Come on, I'll pray for you, brother. 
I'll pray for you, sister. But you do nothing about it. Come on. Do we love our neighbor enough to watch over our tongue, using it to bless others rather than curse them? Do we love our neighbors enough not to slander them? Do, we, do those who are rich love their neighbor enough to not exploit their employees? Do we love our neighbor enough to not complain about them? Do we love our sick neighbor enough to pray for their healing? Do we love our brother and sister in Christ enough to receive their confession and lovingly affirm Christ's forgiveness of their sins? Come on, for James choosing God and drawing near to him always led to drawing near to our neighbor. Come on, when, when you have a relationship with God, your heart beats and you become passionate about the things that God is passionate about. We understand that in Scripture it talks about following Jesus, denying yourself, that you must lose your life in order to find it. It talks about denying yourself and carrying your cross. Come on, that he died at the cross. Come on, that that is good news, that he died at the cross for you and me so that no one would perish, but that we would all, that whosoever believe, come on, we would all have everlasting life. The question is, do you follow Jesus? And you cannot follow Jesus if you only are about you. Come on, you could be knowing all the God things. You could be a church. Maybe you're the guy who's selfish, conceited, pointing everybody's flaws out, not really realizing that one day you're the one that's going to need the very grace that God extended to you. I mean, I, 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 there's a message that I've preached so many times, and I heard it the other day. Re, 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 it, it was said again by Pastor Robert Madu. And it was interesting, and it just brought into remembrance uh, one of my favorite things to say, that Jesus came in love, 100% full of love, or truth and grace. Truth and grace. He came with truth and grace. And we got people that are only on the side of truth, and we got the grace people. In other words, man, you're just so full of grace, and you love everybody, and you're hugging everybody, and you're like, this is awesome. But you're scared to tell somebody the truth. He came 100% truth and 100% grace. And so you got to tell them the truth, or they'll perish. And then there's the other people who got all truth but no grace, not realizing that they're walking around with a big plank in their eye, pointing at everybody at what everybody else is doing wrong, not understanding that one day the very same grace that they're not extending, they're going to need it, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Do you follow Jesus? Philippians 2, verse 9 and 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Romans 10 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him for the dead you will be saved here's a few things that you need to do and we'll close you got to daily choose to put your death uh, put to death my old sin nature we got to daily choose to put to death your own old sin nature. In other words, it's a daily thing that you do so that you could follow Jesus Christ. you got to daily release uh, my past and take another step forward towards freedom. So the more, see, in a born-again experience, the more you keep stepping into the things of God, the more you keep stepping into the Word of God, those become new experiences. And the more you have from faith to faith, from glory to glory, faith to faith and glory to glory, step by step, you begin to forget about those things and putting your past away and stepping into what heaven has for you. Come on, your daily pursuit of God's plan for my life. I got to pursue God daily. I got to pursue Him daily. He may say, hey, did you count the cost? A lot of times we think, man, is this going to be just this genie, man? You know, we preach we preach for times like this. I hear brothers out there preaching the gospel, talking about uh, the times that are coming. Man, for years we've been preaching about all these things that are going to happen. And guess what? People just came to church to numb the pain for a moment when God wanted to heal you for eternity. 
There are times like this and times that we're coming into and that's why they were preaching the word. You got to think why they were preaching the gospel. They were preaching the gospel for perilous times. And at this time, we're starting to realize that maybe what God's been telling us the whole time has been to prepare us for a time like this. My question is, are you sitting at the table that he's invited you into? I love the way the Passion Translation says that he says the love feast. What a beautiful description of what the church should be like. We celebrate the love of Christ through communion, worship, teaching, prophesying, fellowshipping together, and our love for one another. Are you sitting at the table that he's inviting you to? You know, and these guys, when they sat together, they had common union. They were like-minded. They they, they always went to the cross. They always spoke on what Jesus had said. And they fellowshiped. See, the whole thing about life is becoming one with Jesus. It's becoming one with your groom. And they call it a marriage. When you become one with your groom, that is Christianity in a nutshell. You see, you have to die to yourself, lose your life so that you could find your life, and then you begin to become one with your groom. Now, the cool part about that is that when you're becoming one with your groom, he goes everywhere with you. Everywhere you go, he's there with you. And at the same time, everywhere I go, I'm there with him. And he talks to me and he walks with me. And so my question today, right there where you're sitting, is are you ex- who are you? Are you the one just with church clothes? You, you have a form of godliness, yet you deny its power. You don't follow Christ. You, you basically talk about Christ. You know some songs. But in private, you don't have a relationship. And only you would know that. And this is not a message of condemnation. This is him out stretching his arm right there where you're at at home to tell you that he loves you and he's inviting you in. He's like, man, these are the things I love, right? Like in that case, it was his brother getting saved. He's like, these are the things I love. I I love prayer and I love uh, communion and I love worship. and, And I love what the Father teaches. And I love being kind and peaceful. Blessed are the peacemakers. He said all these things that he loves. And he's like, you like, come inside. Sit with me at the table. The question I have for you today is, are you out there angry at God? Are you out there sitting and stomping your feet and not wanting? Or maybe you had a relationship with God and you walked away. Or maybe you feel during this whole pandemic and all this stuff, you're losing your faith. And guess what? He's sitting there. He's inviting you in to sit at that table. And if that's you, right there in your home, I want you to stand up. Stand up. Why? That's not no magical thing, but I believe you're standing up, and I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to see him inviting you to the table, the love feast, the grand love feast. And he says, hey, man, I'm knocking at your door, the door of your heart. I'm knocking. And I want you to let me in. And now you're sitting at that table and you guys are talking. And he's like, do you believe in me? And if your answer is yes, it says when you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that he's Lord. Now he's Lord of your life. That means that now there's a daily death in following him. And so right now, if you said yes, that you're willing to sit with him at the love feast, I want you to hashtag love feast. Hashtag love feast. If you were a guy who got up and walked away, but you're coming back, and you're like, man, this message really spoke to me. I don't want to be the guy that's just wearing shirts clothes. I want to be the guy that's sitting at the table. I want you to hashtag at the table. And what's going to happen right now is we have prayer partners ready to pray with you. As I close out in prayer, 
Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us a word, a warning, a warning, God. Father, we will not take it lightly. I know that you love us, and so therefore that's why you gave us truth this morning. And Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers who are struggling uh, in their lives. I pray that you put people around them. I pray that you continue to order their steps. And I pray that you give them comfort wherever they are today. That my words might bring peace to their soul. The peace that surpasses the understanding of man. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 What an amazing word that Pastor Juan delivered to us this morning. We want to thank you all so much that are at home, that you guys are online watching with us this morning. If this word spoke to you in any way this morning, like Pastor Juan said, we want you to put that hashtag in the comments sitting at the table. Hashtag Jesus. If you gave your life to him this morning and you're laying your life down and you're saying, God, I, I need you in my life. We're excited for you and we are here celebrating with you. And we know that there are angels in heaven that are celebrating you right now. And so we just want to thank you guys again for joining with us this morning um, and that you guys are going to join us next week here for our online Get Wrapped experience. And I'm going to pray us out and we hope that you guys have an amazing week. Father, we just thank you so much um, that you are knocking on the doors of our heart. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that we get to sit at the table. We thank you, God, that we get to serve people. And we thank you, God, that we get to sit at your feet this morning. And we just love you and we honor you in Jesus' name, amen. You guys have an amazing week.